Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, the online subscription service that helps men keep their hair. I'm aware of the irony. More about them a little bit later. You may know best from Apple TV's For All Mankind, a sci-fi drama based on an alternate history where the Soviet Union beats the US to the moon, inspiring a much more prolonged space race involving lunar colonization. In the show, Zvezda is the Soviet base on the moon, rivaling American Jamestown. While this is a work of fiction, the basis for Zvezda, which means star in Russian, is quite real. The Soviets had indeed planned for an extensive moon base as part of their overall N1-L3 human lunar expedition program, and though it was ultimately cancelled along with the rest of the Soviet space program, its concepts and designs may inspire future lunar colonization, whether that be by Russia or other nations. Zvezda was not its own project. Rather, it was one part of the N1-L3 program, the Soviet Union's ambitious attempts to land cosmonauts on the moon and establish a lunar presence. Soviet officials had mentioned reaching the moon and establishing a base as early as 1961, but no practical steps were taken until Sergei Korolev, the USSR's senior rocket scientist, began developing the Super Heavy N1 rocket. Although Korolev originally had dreams of using the rocket for launching an orbital base as well as crewed flights to Mars and Venus, it was ultimately a appropriated for the lunar program, directly competing with the United States' Apollo program. The N1-L3 program was a two-fold initiative. The N1 component was a super-heavy launch vehicle designed to lift the L3 lunar payload into space, while the L3 component was a combination of the Soyuz 7K L3 command ship, also called the LOC, and an LK lander. Together, these components would carry cosmonauts to the moon, land on its surface, and either return them safely to Earth or, long-term, leave them at the Zvezda base. The LOC was an orbital mothership designed to carry two cosmonauts to lunar orbit, while one cosmonaut would land on the moon in the LK or lunar craft. Unlike the Apollo lunar module, which has two separate engine stages for descent and ascent, the LK was a single-stage vehicle, making it smaller and lighter, but also limiting its capacity. Similarly, uh, there was no docking tunnel between the LOC and the LK, meaning cosmonauts would have to spacewalk between the two. This boilerplate design was in large part because the N1 rocket was only capable of carrying 105 tons into Earth orbit versus 155 tons for Apollo Saturn V. Although the N1-L3 spacecraft never landed any cosmonauts on the moon, the USSR did perform numerous test flights. These included four launches with the N1 rocket and dummy LK modules, and they were all failures, including a launch just 13 days before Apollo 11 that destroyed not just the rocket, but the entire launch complex. After Apollo's success, the Soviets continued with three uncrewed test missions in the early 1970s, but they substituted the N1 for a Soyuz L rocket and used a variant of the LK called the T2K. This was essentially the LK lunar lander, just without the landing gear. Referred to as Cosmos 379, 398, and 434, all three tests were successful, and officials deemed the LK suitable for crewed missions. However, N1L3 was cancelled shortly thereafter in May 1974, and the LK never even carried a single cosmonaut, much less delivered one to the Zvezda moon base. Now, just before we continue with today's video, I do want to say that it is sponsored by, well, the most ironic sponsorship in all of YouTube, and that would be Keeps. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're 35? I, <laughs> I had no idea, Keeps. Tell me more about that, please. No, I lost, uh, my hair was almost all gone by, it was going in the mid-20s. It was gone by the late 20s. That was when I was like, Pew! it all came off. Look, it's too late for me. Maybe it's not too late for you. Keeps offers clinically proven research-backed treatments to stop hair loss and improve hair growth. With Keeps, you can get quality expert care without ever visiting a doctor's office or a pharmacy. And the best part is that Keeps offers affordable treatment plans that are typically half the cost of pharmacy prices, plus they're personalized and recommended by a licensed medical provider. And if you've got questions, Keeps also offers 24-7 expert support with a year of unlimited on-demand access to a dedicated medical provider. So you might be wondering, why would you go anywhere else? And if you're wondering that, well, don't go anywhere else. Go with Keeps. There's a link in the description below. It's better in every way. Plus, they've got an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system, which allows you to take better care of the hair you have. So remember, hair loss stops with Keeps. To get a special offer, go to keeps.com slash megaprojects or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash megaprojects. 
And now back to today's video. Despite the cancellation of the N1L3 program, the Zvezda moon base concept continued to captivate the imagination of Soviet engineers and space enthusiasts alike. The base was envisioned as a modular, expandable structure that would facilitate long-term lunar habitation, scientific research, and resource extraction. The initial design featured a series of interconnected modules, including living quarters, research laboratories, and power generation facilities. Over time, additional modules and infrastructure could be added to the base, supporting a growing population of cosmonauts and scientists. Specifically, engineers envisioned nine modules in total, all based around the habitation module and all transported and installed at separate times. Perhaps the most innovative aspect of the design not only would the base expand by the addition of modules, but the modules themselves would grow in size after installation. While only 4.5 meters or 15 feet initially, various mechanisms, including air compression, would expand each module to 8.6 meters or 28 feet. They would also have a final diameter of 3.3 meters or 11 feet and weigh a total of 18 tons. Altogether, this would provide space for 9 to 12 cosmonauts. To ensure the sustainability of the lunar outpost and a dozen people, the Zvezda base would utilize advanced life support systems and relied on in situ resource utilization, or ISRU, in order to reduce reliance on Earth based supplies. For example, lunar regolith would be processed to extract vital elements like oxygen, hydrogen, and metals, which could be used for life support, fuel production, and construction materials. Furthermore, the base would be equipped with advanced communication systems, enabling efficient communication with Earth and other lunar lunar or orbital assets. A nuclear reactor and atomic batteries would provide power, and scientists even envisioned burying the bulk of the base under lunar regolith to protect it from meteorites and dangerous solar radiation. Transportation and mobility were also crucial factors in the Zvezda moon base design. In fact, the initial implementation plan involved sending robotic lunar card rovers to the lunar surface after the first habitation module was delivered and before any cosmonaut had arrived. These rovers were to serve multiple purposes, including conducting preliminary exploration, surveying, and marking out potential landing sites for the remaining modules, and even providing basic maintenance and performing basic construction on the early stages of the base. This was to involve setting up an entire communications relay system between the base and Earth so that the cosmonauts would have a reliable means of communication once they arrived and, of course, so that Moscow could control the rovers before they got there. However, by far the rover's coolest job uh, would come after the cosmonauts' arrival. For one thing, the crew would be able to operate and ride in the various specialized lunar vehicles for transportation and exploration. This uh, would allow for extended excursions over the lunar surface, moon camping trips, if you will, as well as more advanced drilling and excavation purposes. This would allow the Zvezda base to pursue both scientific objectives as well as exploration, and potentially even military missions and reconnaissance if the United States were to build a similar base, as suggested and for all mankind. Even crazier, the concept of lunar rovers at the base evolved into a lunar tram system designed to connect the various modules of the base, allowing for easy transportation of personnel and supplies between the different facilities. Basically, this tram system would have been a train on the moon. While it may seem overkill for a crew of only 12, it was considered an essential part of Zvezda's infrastructure, ensuring that the cosmonauts could move around the expansive lunar outpost safely and efficiently. Now, the main thing that would differentiate it from a typical Earth-based train would be its relative freedom and versatility, since it wouldn't be constrained by tracks. In fact, it would have been capable of leaving the base altogether if needed. In total, the tram was designed to weigh eight tons and consist of four different Lunokhod rover modules. The Lunokhod rover was the pride of the Soviet space program, first created and launched in February 1969, though its rocket disintegrated on the launch pad and destroyed it. Its successor, though, Lunokhod 2, also known as Luna 17, made his History by being the first remote controlled rover to land on the moon in November 1970, after which it spent 11 lunar days traveling a total of 10.54 kilometers or 6.5 miles around the lunar surface while sending back images and soil analyses. This was actually a much fuller life than you might think, since 11 lunar days actually equates to 321 Earth days. Lunokhod 2, or Luna 21, also landed on the moon in 1973, but the pair were the only Soviet rovers that ever touched the surface. The two successful Lunokhod rovers were designed by Alexander Komergian at the Lavalchin Aerospace Bureau. They had eight wheels, each with their own independent suspension, brake, and motors powered by solar charged batteries that could push the Lunokhods up to two kilometers per hour, that's a bit over a mile an hour, 
breakneck speeds right there. Zvezda's tram, however, would consist of specialized Lunokov modules. The first would be a tug, followed by a rover with life support for two cosmonauts on extended missions. Hooked up to that would be a rover entirely devoted to energy production, either through solar panels or a miniature nuclear reactor, with a final module devoted to drilling. In fact, it would have a manipulator arm that would have been capable of drilling and collecting soil samples without the cosmonauts having to get out of the tram and put on spacesuits. This was also possible since the tram, like the base itself, was to have three layers of protection from micrometeorites, heat, and solar radiation consisting of an external metal shell over a special styrofoam layer with a final metal skin underneath. The lunar train would have truly been a home away from home. Work on Zvezda, which really only consisted of theoretical designs in the first place, technically stopped in 1974, when Valentin Glushko, then chief of the Soviet space program, cancelled the N1L3 program. However, he immediately proposed the Vulcan LEK program to compete with the United States' successful Apollo program, and considering that Apollo 17 was slated as the last US moon mission in 1972, uh, they could retake the lead in the space race. The basis for the project was the new super-heavy Vulcan rocket capable of launching 250 tons into low Earth orbit or carrying 65 tons to the moon. But its primary purpose uh, was for use in setting up the Lunar Expeditionary Complex, a lunar base similar to Zvezda that Glushko hoped would far overshadow the Americans' mere footsteps on the moon. LEK was arguably simpler than Zvezda, but more streamlined and no less ambitious. Like Zvezda, the idea was to build it sequentially with specialized modules, though these could be a lot larger than the Zvezda modules because of the Vulcan's heavier load capabilities. In fact, the habitation module would weigh over 21 tons. While lacking the full tram idea, the LEK would have also used a Lunokhod rover for transportation, exploration, and the initial remote control construction. One main difference and improvement on the Zvezda design was the inclusion of a transport vehicle that could travel back and forth between the lunar surface and lunar orbit. In other words, it would have been capable of landing on the moon and taking off again. The LK lander that was included in the N1L3 program and therefore the plans for Zvezda was designed to use its landing gear as the launch pad for its ascent back to the Loch Orbiter. This was similar to Apollo's lunar module and meant that the lander could only land on the moon and take off again once. LEK's lander uh, would have been capable of going back and forth. LEK never really became more than just a thought experiment, though. Just two years later, in 1976, the Russian Academy of Sciences declared that Soviet resources should be directed to adding economic value and improving quality of life, not raising national prestige via the space race. Now, that was the end of LEK, but Valentin Glushko apparently had a one-track mind. Again in 1988, he proposed another lunar base as a part of the Energia lunar expedition based on the super-heavy Energia rocket. The idea was to get around the stipulation for economic value by having the base double as a mine for helium-3 that, in addition to other purposes, could be used for nuclear fusion. Unfortunately, Glushko died shortly after in January 1989, and his dreams for lunar colonization were thwarted by the collapse of the USSR in 1991 and the Glasnost reforms that also brought the previously classified plans for Zvezda and Lurk to light. Nevertheless, Russia carried on his spirit, and not just with the postage stamp released in 2008. An announcement in March 2021 stated that in cooperation with the China National Space Administration, Roscosmos is planning a moon base called the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS, to rival the NASA-led Artemis program, which has its own entire video on this channel, by the way, don't miss that. In other words, while for all mankind might ostensibly be a work of alternate history, perhaps Russia and the US operating competing bases on the moon won't be fiction for very much longer. Could Zvezda, at least in legacy, make it off the drawing board? Is the space race back on?